Um, so, well, well, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak on this topic. It's, um, I'm uh, gratified that you say it's important, it's useful. It's, it's obviously interesting to me um, from my background is in information science, library science documentation. And one of the things that always struck me from really the first time I uh, became interested in the development of what we call the green infrastructure parks and so forth in the 19th century was the extent to which the developments in green infrastructure were happening at the same time as the developments in communications technology, um, in new form of documents and so on. Um, and I'm going to speculate a little bit later as, as to why, why that might be. This is going to be presentation it's not going to have a lot of uh, facts and figures and, and data in it so apologies for, for those who like data presentations and um, this is going to be somewhat somewhat lighter okay and also I am very fortunate in, in having in speaking last because that means that I can take advantage and quote, and I shall do, and uh, quite unashamedly make use of some of the things that have been said in previous sessions, because a number of speakers have made some very interesting points relevant to what I'm going to say and given me a very good lead in for that. Okay, so our title for the talk is taken from a report in the Times um, back in 1850, uh, reporting on a speech given by Prince Albert, um, uh, who was, Speaking at that time in support of and drumming, drumming of enthusiasm for uh, the great, great exhibition. And the says he talked about what a small world it was becoming, modern transport shrinking distances, scholarship making all languages intelligible, revolutionizing communication. Knowledge above all was being transmitted as never before. And that's really the, the theme for this talk that during the period we're looking at, 1830, 1880, um, knowledge is being transmitted as never before through several different kinds of media, as we'll see, through several different um, ways of conveying knowledge, but all being driven by essentially the same thing, which is the application of mechanization and steam power to the transmission of knowledge. And that goes from printing, books and journals, transmission, postal services, people traveling around. Um, as we can see, they all, they, they really, really go together. The period 1830, 1880 is a, a somewhat arbitrary one. Um, it's, it's obviously quite significant in terms of green infrastructure, but it's also explained quite well in terms of the approach I'm taking, because in 1830, uh, Lyle's Principles of Geology is published. And you, you may say, what have the principles of geology to do with the green infrastructure? Well, this book is generally considered to have been the first modern popular account of natural history. And it was followed up very quickly by uh, books of botany, books of horticulture, books of park, park design, etc., etc. Lyle really sets the tone for for it. It's the first bestseller, if you will, um, in the natural history area. So that book marks the beginning of our period in 1830. 1880 is very commonly taken, and my publishing, uh, my colleagues in the publishing department at the university tell me that 1880 is taken as the high watermark of British publishing in terms of the number of titles being produced and the, the number of copies being produced. Um, we're, we're into the modern publishing era. And this, by the way, is going to be very much a UK-based talk. I'll, I'll allude to transatlantic uh, links and to links with other countries, but um, I'm sticking with what I know, which is really the UK situation. And by 1880, we have this very, very large amount of printed material, which there had not been before. It was a real transition, a real phase change, somewhat akin, I would argue, to what we've seen with the internet and social media nowadays. Um, I've exemplified that um, just by some rather nice books of the period, and by W.H. Smith's. Um, their shop, that photo taken around 1880, um, and they are stationers, 
They sell the tools for creating documents, paper, envelopes, pens, pencils. They sell books, they sell magazines, they sell newspapers. They sell the documentation of that age. And the Rage Smiths, of course, very well known, um, stations, booksellers, uh, news agents, began as essentially a railway bookstore. Um, and the growth of this kind of documentation shop, as you might express it, parallels and uh, draws from the growth of the railways and steam powered transportation. Okay, so um, in 1840, um, the Cunard Line ship Britannia, shown here, this rather nice painting in, in the Mersey, um, makes its first journey across the Atlantic. And steam powered transportation, international steam powered transportation, is really significant um, to what were our topics which come later because the ability of a steamship. Um, it doesn't just mean the transport is quicker, though it is, it means it's reliable. You can have a, a timetable from Liverpool to New York. You couldn't really have that with, with uh, sailing ships. In more cases, the ship will leave on such a date and maybe it'll get there sometime. Um, steam brings reliability, it brings timetables, it brings efficiency, and it conveys people and it conveys things, and the things it conveys are often printed documents. And we'll see some quite dramatic examples of what happens there. And also, of course, we have steam trains. This is a poster of a somewhat later date, but it depicts a train around 1850 um, on the London South Western Railway. Um, and this is the kind of train that would have taken Olmsted around on his tours um, down the, uh, the Welsh marches and then across southern England and back to London. Um, steam transportation within a, within a country um, complements steam transportation internationally. It moves people around, it moves uh, documents around. And we have, for instance, the, literally the mail train um, taking that kind of document, co uh, correspondence. So this is the underlying infrastructure that we've got. Uh, the... Underlying infrastructure of the world today, we might well say, is a fiber optic cable or a Wi-Fi um, router. Well, this is what it was in those days. And the change it brought about in communication patterns is analogous to the change we're seeing today. And indeed, one can argue that the, the origins of our modern information society were being set in those days. Um, there are a couple of books which, whose titles describe the telegraph as the Victorian internet, complementing the movement of people and the movement of printed documents with steamships and steam trains. Um, we have the telegraph, the cable, and, and here we see the first submarine cable that was laid between France and England then. 1850, am I right saying that? I oh, am, yeah, in 1850. Um, and the transatlantic cable shown below, um, HMS Agamemnon and USS Niagara laying that in 1858. Um, so we have almost instantaneous electronic communication, but perhaps more, even more important for our purposes, um, we have What's nowadays thought very old fashioned, very staid, very 20th century. Well, in the 19th century, it was really something is the National Postal Service. And no doubt at least two people here recognize this a fine post box, <laughs> uh, the one in Nashville Road, uh, Merkinhead Park, and the uh, Penfold uh, post box. And National Postal Services, um, which we, we, we'll mention a little later, are really quite a, a crucial element of the Victorian information infrastructure. And then we think of the, the technologies of documentation, um, most obviously the printing press, we show up here at the top, um, William Bullock's um, Rotary Press of 1865, which could publish 12,000 sheets an hour and print on both sides of the paper. When you compare that with what was happening barely 50 years before, um, when printers would be producing tens of sheets an hour. When you go up to 12,000 an hour, um, the scale of um, 
the, the difference in scale is really quite remarkable. We also have uh, things that uh, certainly I, I, ne I never thought of, but the transition from making paper from rags and cotton and linen to making paper from wood pulp. And on uh, the bottom left there is shown um, one of the paper making uh, machines um, that they developed. Um, this reduces the price of paper really dramatically. And it enables books and newspapers and magazines and all other forms of printed ephemera to be produced uh, much, much more cheaply than before. And also uh, exemplified by this illustration of some nice 19th century American pencils, we have all the technology that we take completely for granted, and other people of my generation take completely for granted, younger people say, oh, what's that? But um, pens, pencils, paper, erasers on the end of pencils, uh, paper clips, standard size envelopes, standard size papers, all come into existence really in this period we're talking about now, 1830, um, 1880, and transform the way in which communication happens. And uh, going along with that, and particularly important for publications dealing with gardens and parks and landscapes and plants and the like are illustrations. Edward Kemp, uh, in his, uh, when he wrote his first edition um, of his book, How to Lay Out a Garden, uh, regretted that he couldn't um, have illustrations in it. He said he would have liked to have illustrations, but the cost would have been prohibitive. A few years later, he comes to second edition, um, and there are illustrations. Uh, and in the in, in his paper in the Edward Kemp volume of Garden History, Paul Elliott refers to the fact that the second and third editions of Kemp were much more enthusiastically received because of the illustrations. I've shown here from the third edition of Kemp on the left hand side of the screen. Um, I'm sorry, the photograph is not, is not brilliant. Um, it's why I took myself in rather well, poor light. Um, but nonetheless, um, an illustration is really useful embedded in the text. It doesn't have to be on a separate page. Um, the illustrations are not of perhaps wonderful quality. They are the early form of woodblock illustration, um, which was a standard way in which um, books and magazines were illustrated at that time. But the fact that there were illustrations totally, I think it's fair to say, totally changes the way in which information on a what shall we say, uh, an, an image-rich topic, if you like, a topic which can be very much enhanced. Um, its presentation by illustration is, is very great. And then um, at about the same time, we have these lovely things being produced on the right-hand side of the screen. This is a one of the plates from uh, Lindley and Moore's uh, Ferns of Great Britain, published in 1855 uh, by Bradbury and Evans, a very innovative publisher of whom more later. Um, and these were produced by a rather wonderful process called nature printing. Uh, and by that process, um, the, the thing to be printed, in this case, the, the, um, the, the fern, was actually put into um, a, a, roly, a roller device and its image was imprinted directly onto a soft lead plate from, from life. There was no drawing or copying or photographing, anything like that. You put your fern in and it immediately produced there and then the device um, produced the, these really lovely uh, images, which, which were then hand coloured. It was a technology that didn't last very long. It was superseded by photography, um, which is obviously much uh, more flexible, um, a, a little after our period for large scale uh, use of photography doesn't come in until the, the 1890s and even later. Um, uh, just an example, I think, of the amazing things were being done in this period in terms of communicating information, communicating knowledge, and a horticultural subject is the one they use first, at least in Britain, for this. Uh, this was introduced into Britain by William Bradbury, Bradbury and Evans. Uh, he bought it from the its German originator, um, example of the very innovative things that publishers got up to. And uh, finally, in this run through of the changes that came about. The technical changes were accompanied by changes to the law, changes to the legal and uh, regulatory, as we'd say nowadays, environment. Uh, and in particular, the so-called taxes on knowledge, taxes which were charged on 
paper used to produce books and newspapers and magazines were slowly uh, removed. The example here, as you see from the slide, uh, from 1841, an issue of the Gardener's Chronicle has a stamp on it to say that uh, the tax has been paid. Um, and these taxes were, they began to be removed from the 1830s onwards. In Britain, they were finally removed, uh, the, the last ones in, I think, the 1870s. Um, and again, this means that documents of this kind become cheaper, become much more widely available, make a much wider impression. I said I'd make a remark about uh, the influence of steam, steamships um, in conjunction with, in synergy with the steam power document production. Two little vignettes here from um, Transatlantic uh, Publishing. In Britain, there was, there was copyright legislation. It wasn't as uh, elaborate as it is nowadays, but there was copyright legislation at that time. That was not very well developed in the United States. It was a bit more of a free-for-all. Free what that meant is that American publishers really valued speed. They wanted to be the first to get out um, with an, uh, an edition of a European book, if they could. If it could be the authorised edition, if they could say they got an arrangement with a British or European publisher, so much the better. But speed was the thing. And two just little examples of this, um, Chambers of Edinburgh, who were one of the um, very innovative publishers at that time, they were pioneers in using steamships. They were the first people to use steamships to convey printed material. And they used them to go to bring uh, the materials which they published in Edinburgh down to London. And again, it wasn't done for speed because a, sp a sailing ship could, uh, given a fair wind, do it as quickly or quicker. But steamships were reliable. Steamships have a timetable. Steamships are fitting into the modern world of control and uh, managerialism, if you like. So Chambers say steamships are good. And they immediately, as soon as Cunard um, starts their transatlantic journey, Ch Ch Chambers say, we want our material on there. We want that to get to our American publishers, our American partners, faster than anything else. An example of what the American publishers could do is Harper's, um, the publisher of, of, of that time, still around nowadays in a slightly different form. And the claim they make here is in the New York office, they had 28 steam powered presses of the sort that we saw earlier. Right. And the claim was that they could take the proofs of a book off the uh, a ship when it got into New York docks and they would have it on sale in the streets, in the bookstores within 24 hours, which is. I'm not sure a publisher nowadays could, could necessarily do that. So an indication of how the steam power transportation works together with steam powered document production. Okay, um, that's the end of the first part of this talk. And normally I would say, are there any questions? But I will just carry on. Um, I and will take them at the end. Uh, I decided to look at the communication knowledge for the green infrastructure, our main topic, under four headings. Um, and these are not totally watertight and you might uh, prefer a slightly different breakdown, but uh, we'll, we'll try and go with this one. Um, visits, correspondence, the publishing of books and journals, um, that's to say essentially the publishing of specialist material and the publishing of general material, newspapers, magazines and other sort of ephemera. Now, none of these are new. Let's be clear about that. None of these come into existence. People have been traveling around visiting things and visiting places. They've been writing to each other. They've been having books for millennia, literally. But they are transformed. They are, all of these are transformed by the Victorian communication revolution. We'll see how with some of Let's take visits. A map of Olmsted's well-known travels in England. He comes to uh, Liverpool by steamship, goes by steamboat across the Mersey, and then proceeds by steam train, essentially down the Welsh-English border and makes his way back to, back to London uh, and uh, gathering knowledge as he goes. Could he have done that before this communication revolution? Of course he could. People have been travelling across the Atlantic before. Would he have done it? I don't know, maybe, 
maybe not. Certainly, he found it a lot easier, as did the others um, down in Cleveland and the rest um, whom we heard in early sessions visited Europe, visited Britain. <coughs> okay. Um, so, tra tra so traveling around, traveling internationally, traveling within nations, um, specifically to see something that then very often resulting in, in Olsen's case, the journal article followed by a book um, was very common. Also, almost the incidental influence of travel. Uh, Kemp, for example, in his preface refers to his travels through the suburbs of uh, London and the other big cities, and one presumes that he's traveling by train, looking out of the window, um, and seeing the gardens of the houses he goes past and being uh, unimpressed by them and feeling he ought to offer some, some advice. Um, travel is becoming much easier, much more structured, much more reliable. Um, and that's one very significant way in which knowledge is being exchanged. And uh, we've had uh, examples in particular in the second session um, of these talks uh, of very specific examples of other people who, who traveled typically transatlantically um, or throughout the USA um, and the, the influence that had. Correspondence, writing to people, well, again, that isn't new. People have been writing to each other for, for a long time, but with reliable national and international postal services, this again is transformed. Um, and it has a big effect. On the left-hand side here, um, we have a letter from Charles Dickens, um, who is writing to complain about the fact that it is proposed that the Sunday delivery of post be stopped in the place where he lives um, in, in, in Kent. And he actually says, if this happens, if I don't get my Sunday mail delivery, that will affect my activities so much, I'm gonna move house to somewhere where we do have a Sunday mail delivery. Um, it really matters. And of course, many of our protagonists in the green infrastructure were enthusiastic writers and correspondents. And I've represented those here on, on the right by Edward Kemp, uh, writing to Joseph Paxton in 1843 um, about his editing of the magazine of Botany and that's from the uh, archives at Chatsworth. Uh, we have um, the publication of books and journals and what we would term nowadays specialist documentation. I exemplify this from a very wide range of things I could use for exemplification. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, by Joshua Majors, um, Theory and Practice of Landscape Gardening, uh, published by Longman, one of the more important British publishers in this subject area. And the Gardens Chronicle, uh, published by Bradbury and Evans, um, another uh, one. And I, as well as pointing, it's very easy to point to uh, the large number of books, a large number of journals, magazines, and so forth. We've got a, an environment here which is becoming very, very conducive to the exchange of knowledge, exchange of information as being very important um, for the practice of horticulture, landscape design, and uh, all the other activities. And uh, we quote Ludon here, um, right at the start of our period, um, showing how important he thought books were to the gardener. And it's worth bearing in mind, I don't have time to dwell on this, um, that at the same time as this is happening, um, we're finding the expansion of, certainly in Britain, where my remarks are focused, but also in other analogous countries, expansion of formal education, um, many more literate people, many more people getting in the habit of reading things, um, and also the expansion of, if you will, a documentary infrastructure, which I exemplify here um, by this uh, painting of the lovely old reading room at uh, the Birmingham Library just after the end of our period in 1881. So this is not happening just to people interested in green infrastructure, it's happening generally, but the people we're interested in are at least taking a full part in it and maybe uh, to, to a large extent taking the lead. 
just to make a remark about the international aspect of this, a couple of examples here. Um, Kemp's book, um, we see here on the left hand side, published in London uh, by Bradbury and Evans, who we've mentioned before. Um, published then in New York by Wiley, or Wiley and Holstead as they were at, at, at that stage. Um, and they clearly have an arrangement between these two publishers, and Wiley are the, the, they're doing the approved edition of Kemp. I don't think anybody else tried to do a pirate edition, but Wiley had had the approved edi edition. They had an arrangement with Bradbury and Evans. On the right-hand side, um, we've got Downing's book, um, which is being published simultaneously in the US by Putnam's in Britain by, by, by Longman. Um, so different kinds, slightly different kinds of arrangements being taken here um, to, to get books published internationally. It's interesting to, to look at how, um, I think it's fair to say that the, the transatlantic links, Britain and America, um, were done much more formally in this way. There were much more arrangements between publishers. We think of the way other international links were, were handled. Uh, Kemp's books, for example, were, were very influential in Australia. Um, and in the countries of the empire, as it was, it would be much more normal for the book simply be sent out by the British publisher, Robert right, Evans in this case, um, and sold through bookstores in those countries. Um, it's really the, the, um, the US British link where we see most of these formal arrangements between the different publishers. And another example of this uh, international publishing activity, uh, again from Charles Dickens, um, and he's writing here to uh, Frederick Evans of Reverend Evans, his publisher, um, and saying here are the, the proofs of uh, his, Dickens edits the proof of David Copperfield, and he asked Evans to, to get a move on and send these off to Mr. Townschnitz of Leipzig, uh, who is translating um, the book and, and putting it out there. So here we have the National International Postal Service is being used to uh, promote the sale of uh, translated issues of editions of these books. So far as I'm aware, and those here may know better than I, um, there wasn't much in the way of translation of books relevant to park design, to horticulture, to the green infrastructure, not much translation between English and other languages. Um, that, that at least that I'm aware of, but it was, you know, they, they, they were definitely part of this international exchange of documents, international exchange of knowledge. Rodwin Evans, we've mentioned them before, and they're worth another little mention as being perhaps of all the British publishers, the ones who were most closely associated um, with the production of books and magazines uh, relevant to the green infrastructure. They published Kemp, they published Paxton, they published uh, the Gardener's Chronicle, they published Handbook of Gardening. Um, I mean, again, the Gardener's Chronicle magazine is founded by uh, Paxton, Lindley, Dilt and William Bradbury. And William Bradbury um, was a personal friend of Paxton. Really interesting to do a kind of social network analysis and try and work out just how significant that personal friendship between um, Bradbury and Paxton was in, in developing this. Uh, as with many publishers, they began as printers. Um, as you said, left-hand side, printers extraordinary to the Queen. Um, and then they developed into publishing. Um, they didn't by any means just publish material relevant to Parks and Gardens. They published Dickens, they published Thackeray, they published Punch magazine and so on and so forth. Sadly, all that remains of them is this plaque uh, now, which I show on the left-hand side there, um, in Boudry Street, um, just off uh, Fleet Street. Uh, when I last saw it, it looks particularly melancholy because it's attached to a, a closed branch of Sainsbury's, um, which didn't survive the pandemic, so it has a bit of a end of the world feeling to it. I would want to go up and it says publishers Dickens and Thacker I would go up and put and they look Kemp but anyway. Um, they were very very um, innovative publishers. We've already seen they were they were innovative in illustration and using the nature printing approach. They were among the earliest adopters of the very high throughput uh, presses. Um, they were <coughs> 
They were among the people who won a test case um, against the government on these taxes of knowledge when, when to uh, say that their some of their materials shouldn't be taxed. Um, so they are, I think, a, a real poster example, if I would put it that way, for, for the way in which publishers who are very, very closely associated, one or the other British publisher, um, with documents supporting development of green infrastructure, also right in the lead um, in the communications technology revolutions. Okay, that was books and journals. What about newspapers, general newspapers? Well, here's a couple of examples. Um, 18, check that, 1850, on the left, The Observer is uh, relating the latest stage in the uh, long saga of the development of Finsbury Park in North London. On the right, the Manchester Guardian is writing about Queen's Park in Manchester um, and how it's suffering from, from the smoke and so on. And I think it is inarguable um, that there was much more coverage of green infrastructure issues in the newspapers of those days than there is nowadays. Now, I say that without being able to back it up with any data. It'd be really fascinating to do a content analysis and prove that that was the case. I'm sure that it is. However, one thing to note is that the newspapers of those days did not have illustrations. Um, so we have to use our imagination when we read that Queen's Park article to envisage the, uh, the really pretty park which they describe and the uh, damage wrought by, by the smoke and so on. Um, so we consider it today a little bit indigestible, but uh, nonetheless, a, it was a very important way that ideas about public parks and other aspects of green infrastructure get widely disseminated. The other means by which it uh, was widely disseminated was illustrated magazines and most particularly the Illustrated London News. Um, and uh, a, a number of authors have drawn attention to the importance of, of this particular magazine, Illustrated London News, in writing about park design and the like. Uh, I've exemplified that here um, from this issue in 1863, uh, where they write about the new flower garden in Regent's Park in London. And the paragraph I've taken here is, just one, it's one part of a paragraph from a very lengthy and detailed and rather critical article of a thought that I really don't know where you'd see it nowadays, other than in a very specialist magazine aimed at or journal aimed at professionals. Um, and yet, this is in a very wide circulation general magazine. Um, and they have an illustration with it, a rather nice illustration, but very woodblock illustration, much higher quality than that that was used in Kemp's book, for example. Uh, and this is, uh, this is an example of a form of communication, a form of document that we just don't have anymore. Um, what succeeded it? Well, blogs and Instagram, maybe. Uh, the Illustrated London News, although not published by them, was printed by Bradbury and Evans, so they got their inky fingers onto that as well. And just a quick note, another important aspect of ephemera yes. that comes after our period is a picture postcard. Um, and I, this was a tweet from the Royal Horticultural Society Lindley Library saying they've got over 5,000 postcards of them, a bit after our period because they don't come into general circulation until the 1890s. Um, but again, as with the Illustrated London News, a way of conveying ideas about the green infrastructure that's almost entirely gone now. Who sends postcards nowadays? Um, what succeeded, well, I suggest, let's say, blogs and Instagram. Coming towards a conclusion then. We're, I, I thought I should, I literally said, well, intended to start off by asking the question, well, we talked about these four things, visits, correspondence, specialist documents, more general interest documents, which was more important? And I didn't do that because it's a, it's a rather silly question. It's an unanswerable question, but nonetheless, I, I, let, 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 let's have a go. Um, first of all, it's very obvious they go together, they're synergistic. And a wonderful example of that came from a video session, the video conference session that, that was done in the conversation with Olmsted series um, produced from the US, Olmsted and the Writing Life, which talked about Olmsted as uh, a traveler, a book author, um, a journal, 
article author, an editor, a correspondent. Um, he, he, he was as much a writer as he was anything else. Um, and it all seems to go together. Um, and one can look at lots of examples of how, I'll stick with Olmsted, the tr Olmsted travels, he writes an article about his travels, the article is well received, he writes a book, the book is well received, assimilates other people to travel and so on. But there's a synergy going on here. Well, let's try and give an answer anyway, since I've asked the question. Um, and with Edward Kemp, I'll say this is, this was a bookmaking age. I think the books are really what is central uh, because it's a, when you look at how the knowledge is being spread, there's often the books are in there. The books are central. The books are what link the other things together. And of course, the books were perhaps accessible to a very wide audience where we couldn't travel, didn't have people to correspond with. And really in conclusion, Kemp says there has to be something beyond the private reason for writing a book. There should be something beyond the private reason for me presenting a talk like this, but the fact my private reason is I think it's interesting. Uh, I think that firstly, this is a really interesting part of information history. Um, and I think there's a lot of really interesting work to be done here on the writer and editor of the green infrastructure. And in two ways in particular, um, publishers archives, which sadly often have been lost, but some exist, but are not that easy to work through. Uh, Bradbury and Evans archives, which I've been looking at, do still exist, partially. They're not digitized. They're split between the British Library in London and the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of very, very interesting things to be found from that kind of archival analysis. And a social network analysis. Who knew who? Who talked to who? Who visited who? who published who, who edited who. This has been done to a certain extent for publishers. I think it'd be really interesting if we could do it for all the protagonists in general. And really finally, um, I think we can draw some lessons. These people in the 19th century made absolutely best use of their new information environment, the environment of steam, steam travel, steam powered knowledge is this term. And Maybe we could follow their example and make a bit better use than we do of the internet, the Instagram, the metaverse, and all the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. It was really interesting. And I think it's a, it's a very good thread to all the presentations we had before, obviously, to know how all these ideas were circulating and and to reinforce the idea that definitely they were uh, circulating. Um, so I said at the start of the session that maybe some people joined in the meantime. So unfortunately, uh, Paul Rabbits will not be able to be with us tonight. So that's why we have slightly longer presentations. Um, now I will leave the floor to Elizabeth Davy, who is local to me at least, or where I am at the moment, uh, from the rural, and she will talk about uh, our neighbors, parks, and green infrastructures of Wallisey, which is also in the rural. Um, and we are listening. Uh, I will share your presentation, um, Elizabeth. Thank you. Again. Right. The aim of this presentation is to explain how a borough adjacent to Birkenhead developed its parks, its promenades and its pleasure grounds, in fact its green infrastructure, in a very different way from Birkenhead, its close neighbour. As you can see from the map, Wallasey, the area that we're looking at, lies just to the north of Birkenhead. It's its very close neighbour, but the way its parks developed has been very different. If we look back to the beginning of the 19th century, we can see that the area of Wallasey had almost no development except rural villages. It was essentially a number of settlements surrounded by countryside and all of them, or pretty well all of them, with access either to the Mersey or to Liverpool Bay. The first areas of 
land set aside uh, for general use were under the Enclosure Acts at the beginning of the 19th century. And this ensured that while the rest of the area was being brought into cultivation or into enclosure, areas were set aside for the local people so they could obtain building materials, stone, marl, have access to water to uh, water their livestock. And all of those areas which were preserved as a result of the Enclosure Acts are still public open spaces today and I illustrate two of them here. Whereas in Birkenhead, which was growing up very much as an urban area, the need for a public park or open space was much less pressing in Wallasey. As I said earlier, uh, pretty well the whole of Wallasey had access either to the Mersey shore or to Liverpool Bay and a very short distance away was open countryside. So the need for parks was really not very pressing. The need began to show itself with the growth of population. The population, I think, was stimulated by the arrival of steam-powered ferry boats and later by the arrival of the railway. And we can see from these graphs the way the population expanded, growing from just over 8,000 in 1851 to nearly 80,000, what, 78,000 in 1911. And the awareness of the need for preserving open space is made clear in the report of the Wallasey Local Board, where we can see they say the need of open places will soon be felt in the district. That is 1899. And we can see from 1891 the way in which the population is rapidly expanding. Well, as it expanded inevitably as so in so many urban areas, the property that was developed was not like the old rural villages. It was high density housing, many properties opening directly onto the street with almost no area behind, perhaps a little yard, perhaps an alleyway, but little more than that. So very high density housing. And again, the local board was aware that the problems that this was presenting and they said at the rate the district is developing, there will not be an acre of land available in 20 years. So by 1896, the need for a park was very pressing. However, it wasn't in the gift of local authorities, unless they had specific legislation enabling them to do so, to go out and actually purchase land. Uh, this was made general by the Public Health Act of 1875, which said that funds would be available from central government. Um, people were becoming aware of the health dividend of parks. So under that Public Health Act, local authorities were empowered to raise go loans from central government for the purpose of acquiring land for recreation. They were also allowed to receive land that it was gifted to them and so, in fact, the first park in Wallasey was not created by the local authority itself, but as a result of a donation of funding from a philanthropic donor. So it came about in 1883, um, more or less four decades after work had begun on Birkenhead Park, so it gives some idea of its historical context, when a very small area of land was gifted to the parish as a recreation ground. But this was just the beginning. There were a number of other uh, donations later in the history of the area. But of course, under the 1875 uh, Public Health Act, the authority was allowed to purchase land and that land became available uh, with the death of the owner of a large private estate and 1889. 15, 50 acres we can see here of land um, Liscard Hall and it became Wallace's first and largest public park. Many advantages to purchasing a pre-existing estate as I think you can see from the map in that the land has already been landscaped. It, areas are set out as lawn, uh, there are paths, there are shrubberies, uh, there are planting of trees and there is even though on a very small scale a bit of ornamental water. The park was the large hall this had belonged to Sir John Tobin and had been bought uh, by the Wallasey Local Board. It opened in 1891 and the hall itself had a number of functions. It um, not only provided accommodation for the people working in the park, very often a characteristic of parks that accommodation was 
you know, are made available for park keepers. But it had a cafe which raised revenue, and very soon after its uh, purchase, it became the seat of the Wallasey School of Art. So a building that was loved by many generations of people in the area, but which has sadly been burned down. Apart from the hall and the pre-existing landscape grounds, one thing that the um, park keepers or park designers were very keen to include was a lake. As I said, there had been one small area of ornamental water, but here we can see the actual lake as it was dug in Central Park. And in the same way as the lakes in Birkenhead Upper and Lower Park were created, what was dug out of the lake was then spread on the surrounding land to create a sort of a, a topographical feature, if you like, hillocks one could describe them as, though in fact um, they were described as something rather different. So who is going to do this uh, laying out of the park? Well, there are already the borough surveyor, the, the authority surveyor, people like that. But it was decided that even as late as 1890, when the features of parks were generally accepted, they needed somebody to design it. And so we see here an advertisement that was placed in the gardening press for a landscape gardener. What's interesting, I think, is that it tells us there was already a plan made of the area. Anybody wanting to submit a design could obtain a copy of that plan. And very generously, I think, they were offering three prizes. Um, first prize, 30 guineas, second prize, 20 guineas, third prize, 10 guineas. So even if you were not successful, you might actually benefit. And in fact, when it came to the judging, uh, there was a further prize awarded to one uh, design that the um, authorities thought had merit. It was all done very, very um, democratically and the submissions were submitted anonymously. So there was no question of anybody benefiting from being known. So work began on the park and almost immediately people were really commenting on the healthy dividend, the health dividend. Now we were aware of this during Covid when public parks and exercise in open spaces was very important to people who were otherwise in lockdown. But here we can see the report of the Medical Officer of Health saying how the acquisition of a public park um, would be of utmost benefit to the health of the population. So you know, he's praising his employers, another mark of the progressive policy adopted by the board. And here we have um, another feature really sort of linked to health and well-being, which was a very common feature of parks at this particular period, the erection of a bandstand. Here is the bandstand in Central Park because they wanted to bring an audience into a park. They wanted to bring them away from the evils of the gin shop. So you know, every Saturday, probably evenings in the summer, bands would play on the bandstand. And so we can see music, the finest thing to counteract the effects of the gin shop. As well as the uh, music that was being provided, there were other forms of recreation, other things to draw people into the park. And we've already looked at one of them, which was the creation of a lake. The landscape gardener, James Pennyforn said that lakes were almost an integral and indispensable part of a park. But here we see from the minutes, the Wallasey Council agreeing that they would create a lake. It was to provide skating in winter, or as in the case of this particular photograph, rowing boats in summer. Um, today, I think there would be issues with health and safety, but in fact, nobody need have worried because though there's an extensive area of surface water, it's actually not very deep. But we can see people hiring their boats, much pleasure being had from going out on the lake. And here's the lake today. One of the features of lakes in Birkenhead Park and many lakes in parks is that they have an island. And this is not just sort of for the provision of uh, water birds. It's, it's actually providing a purpose because never can you look for the entire length of any body of water if it has a an island in the middle. It's the case in Birkenhead. Here's the case here. So the lake and its island in Central Park. The material from the lake, as we've already said, 
was used to create landscaping round the edge of the park. I mean, it had been landscaped in that it was an area for the um, hall, but it needed a little bit more topography. So here we have what were described in the minutes as the trimmed mounds in the vicinity of the lake. But it wasn't just uh, bandstands, it wasn't just the provision of the cafe, it wasn't even just the lake. People were becoming more and more aware of the needs of children, uh, children and adults in regulated activity. So facilities for a whole range of sports were provided in Central Park, um, including bowling and um, quoits. Quoits has now almost disappeared as a sport today and of course increasingly football but also equipment was provided in a number of Wallasey parks for children and I think a, a number of adults enjoying this as well. I'm not sure whether this particular piece of equipment would pass health and safety today but everyone's having great enjoyment then. So the initial park, Central Park, uh, apart from the small um, legacy from up Alderman Smith were the result of purchase but philanthropy plays its part and two brothers uh, linked to the Harrison shipping firm gave land in memory of their parents James and Jane Harrison. This was to the north of Wallasey village it had been an area of almost uninterrupted sand dunes and to some extent I think the local authority the urban district council of the time well, was less than uh, grateful at being given this land because in order to create any sort of football area, any level ground, the sand had to be removed and topsoil had to be brought in. But nevertheless, uh, within a very few years, they had created um, the, the beginnings of a modern park. There was never much planting here apart from grass, but we can see the sinuous walks, uh, the park benches and the shelter. Uh, much smaller but also um, philanthropic um, uh, donation was the quarry recreation ground. Uh, it was the same donor that we met at the beginning, uh, Alderman James Smith. And what is nice, I think, is that as you approach the quarry recreation ground, there is this ornamental gateway into the grounds, which is in remembrance of James Smith, in grateful remembrance of James Smith, 1841-1909, who converted this quarry into a pleasure ground. What it doesn't say is at his own expense, always a key factor in local government. But again, the place is growing, land is being built up, and it was important that where there was open space, it was retained, if at all possible, for public use. So 1898, the then Wallasey Council purchased two adjoining mansions whose gardens ran down to the Mersey shore. Um, the properties were called Discard Vale and the Woodlands. And here we can see the illustration of one of them as it was when it was first bought and as it is today. And together, the grounds of these two large mansions formed Bill Park. And so here is the ornamental gateway into the park leading from the promenade real civic pride in what it says. The Urban District Council of Wallasey Vale Park opened May the 20th, 1899. And we can see the names of all those involved inscribed on the gate bills. Of course, I'm saying it's leading from the promenade, but at the time, the promenade was still in the process of construction. And this, I think, of all the things that the various authorities in Wallasey did over time, was probably the one which really people benefit from today and which showed real municipal foresight. And that was the purchase of all the land abutting both the Mersey and Liverpool Bay, on which over the years, 1891 to 1906, they created a promenade, which replaced the open shoreline. The open shoreline was it's fine, you can walk on the beach, but it wasn't anywhere that you could walk for any length of time or in any degree of comfort. So the creation of the promenade was a real, um, a really imaginative move. What one doesn't realise, I think, just from the photographs, is that it wasn't just the promenade they created, but they also, where it was possible, bought up any stretches of open land, the old river cliff 
um, and so on, adjacent to the promenade. So there was an almost continuous area of green abutting the promenade, as well as the promenade itself. Well, promenades are wonderful to walk on, but promenades are also places where people want to stop. And we find both in this new park, Marine Park, the northern part of Wallasey, and along the promenade itself, a succession of benches. And when you look at the advertisement for benches at the time, they are described as being suitable for promenades, public grounds and square gardens. So here we are, Marine Park, uh, people sitting, facing the sea to the north and with a shelter and somewhere bands could play if necessary. But shelters, very important because this is a windswept corner of Wirral and increasing numbers of visitors were coming to the area, day trippers, people staying longer and they wanted some of them to sit even if the weather wasn't clement. So we get a progression of really very fine cast iron shelters being constructed round the promenade, many of them as uh, with uh, drinking fountains probably coming from the Saracen foundry up in Glasgow. So we can see cast iron shelters here and the one in the middle uh, which is um, faced in Minton tiles has the advantage at the back hidden away of public conveniences. So there they are on the promenade. But I mentioned the need to deter people perhaps from drinking alcohol. Well, if you're going to deter people from drinking alcohol, you need to provide them with an alternative. And so a feature of many, many parks are the drinking fountains. Uh, Birkenhead had a drinking fountain, um, which was also a memorial. Um, but here it's a rather unusual drinking fountain, not built by the Saracen country, but by another company. And you can see it's providing drinking water to people in Harrison Park. But memorials, as I mentioned, there is a drinking fountain in Birkenhead in the form of an obelisk. It's now no longer functioning, which was also a memorial to one of the Birkenhead worthies. But here we have rather a more unusual memorial. Memorial is very much a feature of public open spaces. But this one, not as a result of wars of the 20th century, but as a result of a colonial war the end of the 19th century, the turn of the 20th century, the wars in South Africa. And this particular memorial commemorates the men of Wallasey who lost their lives in the South African War, 1899 to 1902. But what is unusual, I, well, I think unusual, is that it doesn't just commemorate those who died, it also commemorates everybody who served, so those men who returned home again as well. So, Wallasey has been very well endowed with its green infrastructure. It has open spaces that were the result of the Enclosure Act. It has open spaces that were the result of generous philanthropy. It has open spaces that were created by the various local authorities over time. And it has completely ringing both the east and the northern side, a promenade, places where people can walk. So access to the healthy provision of parks and open air, very generous in many ways. And we can see, again, the Medical Office of Health commenting on this. The greatly improved health of the area is largely due to the active policy pursued by the Parks and Improvement Committee in providing the Promenade, the Central and Vale Parks, the new Brighton Marine Park, and also other open spaces and recreation grounds. What is interesting about this particular picture is it shows a very different style of planting to what we might have seen some decades earlier. There's been a real attempt, I think, to cope with global warming in terms of the species that are planted and in reducing the labour costs and the input for watering and so on of formal bedding. So Vale Park, one of the many parks and open spaces which make up the green infrastructure, a wonderful legacy for Wallasey. Thank you. I haven't seen any questions in the chat, uh, nor any virtual hands. Um, 
does anyone has a question or a comment? Well, Robert's got his hand up. Yes, you can unmute yourself, Robert. Can you? Yeah. No, we can't hear you. Not better? Yeah. Brilliant. Well, it's a question that really applies to both, and I really enjoy two wonderful papers uh, and the way they were presented. The problem, in a sense, is what were ultimately the key determinants in laying out new public parks or green infrastructure in general? And David's quite right to point to this list, a lengthy list of variables, but how does that actually relate to the typology and timing of park developments, whether in this country or elsewhere? Because in a way, Elizabeth's case study, which is quite fascinating, has a different message. Um, it's conditional on the ability of local authorities to raise money, to raise loans. It remains conditional on private philanthropy. And uh, the speed of development actually must have left um, park provision policy way below what is being suggested as the required limit because you know, there was increasing concern that the urban working class was not given adequate access. Um, so how do we contextualize? How can we synthesize the range of factors to come up with a clearer explanation of the trajectory in developing public art provision as a whole? David, do you want to answer this? I will have a try at that. Um, gosh, um, looking at it through the lens that I was adopting and the communication thing, um, I think what would be a really fascinating thing to do is to look at the parks that were opened, when they're opened, how they're opened, and then try and see what if anything was, was happening around them in a communication sense. I mean, I gave the example of the that newspaper part about, about Finsbury Park. And obviously that, that, that had a very, very um, delayed and lengthy uh, process before it was eventually created. Um, but it being really documented and pushed at each stage um, by, by the press, by newspapers, which I think was a, quite a new thing for that time. Um, so I, I think what, what would be really interesting to do is, I'd say, to, to try and look at the, the information environment in detail around the openings and the design of each park. We want, one can say in a very general hand wavy sense that, oh, well, as the period we're looking at progressed, there was more information available, there were more maps, there were more uh, images there were more reviews there was more writing um and I, I think that that is plainly so but how exactly that influenced and if there was a single way in which that influenced it or if it was just a, a rather general raising of consciousness as to what was being done elsewhere and what could be done here which had to be interpreted differently in a different context for each one i'm not sure i suspect it's the latter but um i think there's a very interesting research project there for someone Thank Could you I very pick much. Up, yeah, pick up on that just in terms of the newspapers, because one of the things that I found when looking at the newspapers were letters to the editor. And there was a very lengthy letter uh, to the editor of the Birkenhead News saying, Worsley should follow the example of Birkenhead and have mm. a park, um, which I thought was quite interesting. And he goes on to say, you know, the reasons why. But we forget that it isn't just the straight reporting, but that newspapers are a vehicle uh, for, if you like, the ordinary person to air their views. Thank you, Elizabeth. David Jakes, do you want to do, say something? 
Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, I, I hope you can hear me. Um, I, I was interested to see the map that uh, David Borden had produced showing Olmsted's journey through England. Um, I mean, I, I'm rather used in the 18th century uh, to find that tourists uh, went on prescribed um, routes. You know, they had guides and uh, they were taken round in circuits. But uh, the question is, did Olmsted design his own um, tour? And if so, where did he get his information from to do so? Hey, uh, well, first I should say I, I didn't design or draw that map. Um, I took it from the US Olmsted site, and it's somebody who's actually organizing a tour in Olmsted's footsteps. He's written it out very nicely. Um, so when, when one reads Olmsted's writing and his description about that, um, he he doesn't really say always where he got the idea. It does seem that he is, um, he hasn't got it planned out completely when he starts. He has some things he wants to see, but then um, going through his book in each chapter, he certainly gives the impression that he's being led by events. Um, someone tells him he should go somewhere, so he goes there. Uh, there isn't a convenient train to where he wants to go, so he goes somewhere else. It all seems to be a bit, um, was a bit haphazard. Um, and as I say, he didn't write this down anyway. So he said, I, 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 I'm fairly sure, and I think he says, that at the start of his tour, he didn't know it would end up like that. It was, a, it was a bit, it was a bit haphazard. I think he had a list of things he definitely wanted to see, but the route he followed, um, and what, what exactly he saw and where he went and in what order seems to have been a bit accidental and, and driven by, by circumstances. And uh, certainly at, at that stage, um, although obviously there was a rail network there and, and he did get around, um, I don't think there was anything like the, what I call the information infrastructure. There wasn't a guidebook he could follow. Um, there wasn't a guide of re recommended routes. He, he was making it up as he went along and clearly using local knowledge um, as he went along, being advised by the local people where he should go, how he should get there, where he should go. Um, he's probably one of the, one of the first rail tourists, I think. I mean, he, he didn't entirely travel by rail. He, he used some other methods, but it was largely a, a railway tour. And he was probably one of the first people in Britain to do that and to write up his experiences. Thank you very much, David. Um, anyone has a last concluding comment or question before we talk about the in-person conference a bit? Great. Well, thank you very much to all of both speakers today and all the speakers of the previous sessions as well. I think we had a, a nice range and very interesting presentations um, over this uh, couple of months.